So Ephesians and chapter 5 and verses 8 through to 14. Now found over 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle, uh, Tromso is home to extreme light variations. So, for example, during the period called the Polar Night, which lasts from November through to January, uh, the sun doesn't rise at all, meaning for all that time there's no daylight. Um, It's not completely pitch black all of the time, more of a constant state of twilight. Uh, But then you come to the period called the Midnight Sun, which lasts from May through to July, where the sun never sets. And so you have 24 hours a day all through this period, May through to July, uh, 24 hours of daylight. So you have two extreme contrasts in one town. You have constant twilight or you have constant daylight. Well, in the section that we're looking at this morning, again, we have two extreme contrasts. But here, it's not the the contrast of light and twilight. It's the contrast of light and darkness. And light and darkness, not in terms of our physical environment, but in terms of our spiritual identity and behavior. So, for example, look at verse 8, where Paul says, "'Walk as children of light.'" Contrast that with verse 11 where he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. So you have light and you have darkness. Now verses 8 to 14 are closely connected to verses 1 to 7. Again you have the theme of children, verse 8, which mirrors verse 1. Again you have the theme of walking, verse 8, which mirrors verse 2. In verses 1 to 7, we are called to walk in love. In verses 8 to 14, we're called to walk in light, to walk as children of light. And so God's new community is to be a community of selflessness and sacrifice and love, and we looked at that last week, but it's also to be a community of light. It's to be a light that is shining out into the darkness of this world, and we're looking at that this week. Now, at the beginning of verse 8, Paul explains to these Ephesian believers what they once were. He reminds them of what they once were. He says, for at one time, you were darkness. At one time, you were darkness. The song that we sometimes sing puts it like this. I once was lost in darkest night. A darkness in the Bible, it represents ignorance and evil and spiritual blindness. A Paul has already spoken on this theme in chapter 4 and verse 18, where he says that those who are not Christians, they darkened in their understanding. Now notice that when Paul describes what they once were, he doesn't describe them as having been in darkness, although that is obviously certainly true, but rather he describes them as having been darkness itself. He says, at one time, you were darkness. And is that how you see yourself, how you used to be before God and his amazing grace worked in your life? Not that you were just in an environment of spiritual darkness, you were spiritually lost, you were spiritually blind, but that you were darkness itself. And following the logic through, in contrast in this passage, the things that you said and the things that you did were fruits of your darkness. Now, this is not a flattering description of us, is it, before we come to know the Lord? But then, in the middle of verse 8, Paul moves on to what they are now. What these Ephesian believers and what uh, us today when we are saved and trusting in the Lord, what they are now. So he he says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now you are light in the Lord. A light in the Bible represents truth and righteousness. And notice again that it's not that he says that you are now in the light, although of course that is certainly true, but rather he says You are now light itself. You once were darkness, but now because you are united to Jesus, because you were in Christ, you are light. This is radical transformation. 
Now, you remember Paul saying in Acts 26 that through him, God was turning people from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And he's saying something similar here to these Ephesians. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So you remember in the Old Testament, they had the the golden lampstand that was lit in the tabernacle or in the temple, which reminded Israel that they were to be a light to the nations. And of course, Israel very much failed in this, but but Jesus didn't, and he was the true light, John says in chapter 1. He was the true light that came into the world. I am the light, Jesus announces in John 8. I am the light of the world which makes what he says to his disciples in Matthew 5 even more staggering, where he says that not only is he the light of the world, but that you are the light of the world. And he encourages them and commands them not to keep their light covered up. You remember how Paul told the Philippians in chapter 2 that they were to shine like lights or stars in the darkness of this world. And then you remember how the seven churches of Asia are pictured in Revelation 1. They're pictured as, as, as golden lampstands. Uh, they're picking up on the, he's picking up on the, uh, the, the, the Old Testament piece of temple furniture. Uh, and they were to be lights shining out into the darkness of of this world. Do you imagine if, if someone asked you what you were and you told them that you were a light? I imagine that they wouldn't really expect that as an answer. And then imagine they ask, well, what do you do? And you say, well, I bring light into people's lives. I bring light into different situations. I imagine that uh, they would feel, on the one hand, slightly perplexed, but on the other hand, might think that you were slightly arrogant. But this is what you are. This is what you do. You are a light. And you bring light. Uh, I remember going uh, caving with a group some years ago, and we got to the the deepest and the darkest uh, part of the cave system uh, that we were going through. And the instructor, he got us all together, and he told us all to turn our head torches off. And I've never been in a place which is so dark before. And it didn't matter how much you strained your eyes, you just couldn't see anything because there wasn't any natural light that was um, entering into the cave. He told us to put our, our hands in front of our faces. And, and yet, however close your hand got in front of your face, still you couldn't see it. And it was so dark, it was almost as if you could feel the darkness. Uh, but, but then this instructor, somehow he managed to, to cup his torch in his hand and, and turn the torch on without any of the light escaping through his hand. So his, his torch was on, but it was still completely black. Uh, and, th- and then slowly he opened up his hands and the light it just sprang out of his hands and immediately started to illuminate the cave. As Christians, it's not just that we are now in the light. It's not just that we are now in the spiritual light and we can now spiritually see and we are now in spiritual daylight, but but also because we are in the Lord, because we are in Jesus, because we are united to the one who is the light of the world, we too are now light. By the lives that we live and the things that we say, we bring illumination. So you imagine your place of work or your home or your class or your street. You are a light that is shining in that place. And God has placed you there as one of his lampstands, as one of his torches. So but that by the power of the mighty spirit and through his great grace, he might bring the light of Jesus into people's lives. And, and what an immense thing this is. What radical transformation has taken place. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Do you realize what you are? Is this how you see yourself? That you are light in the Lord. And so we come to the end of verse Eight, all the way through to verse 12, where we find out how these believers and how we are to live in respect to this, how they were to live. And of course, as we come to these verses, we remember that as Paul gives uh, the instructions that he gives 
uh, throughout chapters 4, 5, and 6. He, he does this uh, having in chapters 1 to 3 um, described in wonderful detail the, the grace of God in these people's lives. So in, in them going from darkness to light, it's not that they've turned over a new leaf and are now living uh, just a, a good life of behavior, but no, God in his grace has in such wonderful love forgiven them and saved them and washed them clean of all their sin and he's united them to Jesus and he's working by the power of the spirit in their lives and, and, and they won't be living a, a perfect life in this life but, but now we're, we're told how by the power of God's spirit they are to live and there are different aspects to this here in these verses and I want to highlight five words and the first word is walk Walk. In Isaiah 2 and verse 5, God's people are called to walk in the light of the Lord. Uh, you remember a similar theme in Psalm 119 where we find that God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Well, here in verse 8, they and we, uh, we're called to walk as children uh, of light. Uh, we find in God's word, don't we, that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And, and as his children, we too are to walk as light. Walk as children of light. As we said last week, walking is a way of describing our manner of life, how we live. So by the help of God's spirit, because we are united with Jesus, who is the light of the world, with God's help, our behavior is to conform to our identity. Now, what will this mean in practice? We'll look at verse 9. As we try with God's help to live out his word, it will mean a life that is shining with what is good and true and right. It will mean a life that is shining with things that are a direct contrast to verse 3. So verse 3 and verse 9, they're, they're direct contrast to each other. So you think of the world in all of its spiritual darkness, and the people around you lost in spiritual darkness, and they're identified as darkness itself, but then as you come walking past, you are a light that is shining in the darkness. Your life and your words and your actions, they point people to Jesus, the light of the world. They illuminate truth. They reveal things about, the, uh, about God. Uh, so perhaps you're, you're a Christian and you're a mum and you spend time chatting with other mums as you wait to pick up your children from school and, uh, and the kindness that you show and the gracious way in which you speak about things and others and the concern that you have for people to come to know Jesus, you are a light that is shining in the darkness. Or, or maybe you're a Christian and you're employed and you work in the warehouse or in the office and, and as you try to um, live by God's spirit like Jesus, uh, the honesty that you display and the trustworthiness that you're known for, you are a light that is shining in the, in the darkness. Or, or maybe you're, you're a Christian, you're, you're a child, you're a teenager and you go to school and, and the way in which you don't swear and the way in which you look out for those who don't have any friends, you are a light in the darkness. Or maybe you're a student at university and you're a Christian and, and the purity you demonstrate amongst your friends and, and the self-control in, in, in the drinking culture, you are a light in the darkness. Or maybe you're a Christian and you're retired and you're, you're well known in your street, in your neighborhood and, and the care that you show for those who are lonely and, and the joy and the contentment and the thankfulness that you have in Christ, you are a light that is beaming out into the darkness of people's lives and situations, shining with what is good and true and right, bringing illumination and the light of Jesus into people's lives. We are to walk as children of light. Uh, but then secondly, and uh, this is another way of saying the same thing really, we are to produce fruits of light. We are to produce fruits of light. So you have the illustration of walking, there's also the illustration of fruit growing and harvest. So the things that we are to shine with in verse 9, they're described here as fruit. You remember in Galatians 5, you have the fruits of the Spirit. And in Philippians 1, you have the fruits of righteousness. Well, in keeping with this metaphor, Paul describes them here as the fruits of light. 
I remember when I was younger and mum used to take us to places uh, where you could pick your own fruit and we used to love it. Uh, Whether it was strawberries or raspberries and you would fill up these huge containers with all of this delicious fruit, uh, trying to avoid the temptation of eating it before it was weighed and paid for and you just couldn't wait to get it home to have strawberries and ice cream with sugar and just enjoy this mini harvest that you had gathered in. Well, here we find that if you are a child of light, then by God's grace and with his help, you will produce the fruits of light. And the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So you imagine plants in a field and the light of the sun shines on it and the plants grow and much fruit is produced. So as we are connected to the true light that radiates on us, so there should be this harvest of of spiritual fruit that grows in our lives and is enjoyed and gathered in by Jesus. Uh, The third thing in how we are to live, and that is, we are to discern, verse 10. Uh, We are to try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, the word discern here means to test, uh, to put to the test, to see whether something is approved or not, to see whether something is genuine. Uh, When the the Falklands War began, uh, Enoch Powell addressed Margaret Thatcher in the House of Commons. And he said something like this. He said, the prime minister, uh, shortly after she came into office, received the name the Iron Lady. In the next week or two, this house, the nation, and the right honourable lady herself will learn of what metal she is made of. Uh, Later, when the war was over, Enoch Powell returned to the subject in a parliamentary question. And he said, is the right honourable lady aware that the report has now been received from the public analyst on a certain substance recently subjected to analysis and that I have obtained a copy of that report? He says, it shows that the substance under test consisted of a material containing iron of the highest quality and that it is of exceptional tensile strength, is highly resistant to wear and tear and to stress, and may be used to advantage for all national purposes. You see, she, in his eyes at least, had been put to the test, and her metal had been proved. She had been proved to be the Iron Lady in his eyes. Now, now one of the things that darkness is associated with, and you see that there in verse 12, is that darkness is associated with secrecy, with with keeping things hidden and covered up, and not willing to allow things to be put to the test, not willing for things to come under scrutiny. Whereas one of the things associated with light is openness and transparency, not wanting to avoid the examination of God's word, a willingness to put things to the test, and, and, and what Paul is saying here is, is that as children of light, we are to want to put all that we do to the test. Uh, we are to be wanting to be willing to, uh, to um, examine um, our, our behavior and our thoughts and our words against the light of God's word to test and learn and see what is pleasing to the Lord and uh, and where we come to the realization that something is not pleasing to God instead of wanting to carry on in secret we are to want to with God's help uh, to stop doing what is not pleasing to him we are to discern we are to test You remember David's prayer at the end of Psalm 139 where he prayed this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So we are to discern. Fourth word is separation. Separation, you see light and darkness, they are the complete opposite. In verse 7, Paul has already said that we are not to be partners with those who are children of disobedience. Here in verse 11, he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. And now he's not saying that we are not to talk or mix with or interact or even work alongside those who are not Christians. But he is saying there is to be this separation. Separation. 
He's saying light and darkness, they, that, that they shouldn't mix, that they can't mix, they're, they're opposites. A separation in that we're not to join in with them in some of the things they do, the things that are characterized by darkness, described here as the unfruitful works of darkness. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 12 that the separation is to be such that we shouldn't even talk about what they do. Those things they do in secret that is associated with darkness, that they want to keep covered up. Uh, And Paul here, he's referring back to the behaviors of verse three. Those behaviors which people normally don't like others finding out about. So for example, when someone has an affair, they try to keep it a secret. They try to keep it under wraps. Uh, They hide it. Now what Paul means by verse 12 is not that we should never talk about the behaviors of verse three or other wrong behaviors, but rather that we shouldn't gossip about them or or talk about them in a trivial way. So you find out that someone that you know is having an affair or it's reported that someone in public life has been unfaithful or you are aware of the breaking of marriage vows in a story or a film. And, And the question that Paul is raising is, is how do you talk about it? Uh, How do you talk about it at home or in the coffee shop or in the office? Because sometimes the way in which we talk about sin can normalize sin. Uh, And Paul is saying here, he's saying saying we're not to join in the unfruitful works of darkness, even if it's only in conversation. Rather, fifth thing, verse 11, we are to expose them. As children of light, we are to expose them the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, So you know what it's like when you lift up a stone and all those little creatures that love darkness like wood lice come scurrying out and they do it because suddenly they're exposed. You've brought light into their situation and into their lives and they don't like it, they love the darkness. And this is what Christians are to do. And not just in relation to verse three but In other areas as well, they are to expose, they are to show up the unfruitful works of darkness. Not not like the tabloids who who love a a story, but out of a concern for righteousness and goodness and God's glory and eternal souls. So this may mean on some occasions, in a very caring and loving way, speaking to someone about what they're doing. Uh, showing them from the Bible that what they're doing is really not right. Most of the time, it will be in the way that you live that does the exposing. So your fruits of light, of light in verse 9, your fruits of light in verse 9 will lift up the stone and expose the unfruitful works of darkness. So you go back to the Christian mum who chats to other mums while waiting to pick up her children and her, her kind and thoughtful, gracious conversation is like a spotlight that shows up their gossiping for what it is. Or you think of the behavior of that Christian employee in the warehouse or in the office and, and his humble honesty and trustworthiness makes his colleagues feel uncomfortable about how they play the system. Or that Christian child or teenager who who looks out for those who don't really have any friends at school. It challenges the consciences of those who are selfish and who laugh and take the mickey out of people like that. Or or you have the student who's a Christian at university and and they don't sleep around. And and just in doing so, they, they expose the idolatry in others. Or or that retired Christian neighbor who who is so clearly content in Christ and has this peace and this joy and sense of thankfulness about them. It it makes those who are always complaining thoughtful. Now this may come at a price because people don't like to have their behaviors exposed or shown up or challenged, even if it's only through the gracious example of someone else. Uh, People may treat you differently, they may make life difficult for you, but look at verses 13 and 14. Uh, We finish by thinking about, well, what happens when the unfruitful works of darkness are exposed? What happens when light exposes sin and there is illumination with truth. Well, verse 13, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, 
So this is good. Darkness hides the ugly reality of sin and light exposes it and shows it up for what it is. And then verse 14, for anything that becomes visible is light. People find it hard to be certain of what Paul is saying here, but he, he seems to be saying here that light not only exposes, but it also transforms. So, so not only does the righteous life and example of a godly Christ-like Christian challenge and may restrain someone who's not a Christian, but it, it may also lead to their conversion as they have their sin exposed and become aware of their guilt and their need of a saviour. And that would fit with the second half of verse 14, where Paul says, and quotes, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Which is either a summary of Isaiah 61 and verse 1, or a quotation from a first century Christian hymn. So someone's light through their gracious behavior can show up someone's sin and that person can be converted. Angus McGilroy was um, a Scottish prisoner of war held in one of the Japanese camps on the River Kai in World War II. And these camps, they were full of Australian and American and British soldiers, and, and conditions were so horrific and so bad that these soldiers, they became almost like animals in their struggle to survive. So they would think nothing of stealing a dying soldier's uh, water or food for themselves. But then in the midst of this horror, things began to change, and People started to feel guilty about what they were doing, even though the conditions were so bad. They started to feel thoughtful. Behavior started to change. People started to look out for each other and support each other and care for each other and share what they had. Um, some even turned to, to God himself, and, and a church was set up, and, and it was called the Church Without Walls. And it all began with this man called Angus McGilray. Um, Angus had a friend in the camp who was dying, uh, someone stole his dying friend's blanket, and so Angus gave him his. Uh, someone stole this dying man's food, and so Angus gave him his. And the outcome was, was that this dying man got better and recovered, but Angus died. And as news of this carried through the camp, people started to feel guilty about what they'd been doing. Uh, the love and the kindness and the generosity of Angus, his self-sacrificing um, kindness, it exposed the selfishness of others. And people became thoughtful and guilty. Some turned to God, and God used it to bring great good into people's lives. And God can use your life as a light to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, your life as a light to bring light into different situations and into different people's lives. And God can use that by his spirit to bring people to the one who is the light.